Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa azwajihi wa dhurriyatihi ajma'in wa ba' fa inna astakal hadith kitabullah wa khayrul hajj hajj Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sharral umur muhdathatuha wa kullu muhdathatin bid'a wa kullu bid'atin dalala wa kullu dalalatin fi nar ayyuhal ikhwatul kiram wa akhwatus sayyidat assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh uh, dear brothers and sisters, as I mentioned to you uh, be, uh, just before we got started, uh, this is um, a portion of the overall Dawa program uh, that has been developed by the Islamic Teaching Institute. Uh, this Dawa program, uh, we are developing it into a Dawa manual, uh, a Dawa manual which will be available soon uh, on uh, VHS, DVD. CD audio, cassette, and also a physical written manual. Um, and it will be basically step by step for anybody to be able to follow. We will also make it available through the website so that if people cannot come uh, to a session like this, they can basically plug in at certain times and they can get this lesson via the website. This is called uh, long distance learning. Uh, it is a three part Dawa training session, uh, which includes one, the understanding, the fiqh of the da'wah, the understanding according to the Qur'an and the sunnah, the fiqh of the da'wah, uh, and also the manhaj, manhaj meaning the methodology, methodology according to the three generations of the Prophet the uh, generation of the Prophet the companions, the tabi'een, the atba tabi'een, and then that which is supported by the scholars of Islam. Our session today will be Dawa Techniques, which is the third part of the program. Uh, I chose to do the Dawa Techniques in most cases because the fiqh of the Dawa is something that you could read. The manhaj of the Dawa is something that you can read. Um, so if you don't have, or if I don't have, if we don't have the ability to teach a 30-hour course, which usually takes a week. It takes a week. That is six hours a day for five days. If we don't have a week to spend somewhere, then we offer the Dawa techniques because the Dawa techniques cannot be learned by reading a book or listening to a cassette. You can read all the books on Dawa, you can listen to all the lectures of the sheikhs. You can read Sheikh Ahmed Didad, look into his tapes and videotapes and Dr. Zakir Naik and all the premier people that do Dawa. You can listen, read, but you're not going to learn these techniques. And there are techniques involved. It's not just something that they're just doing. The Dawa techniques normally would be a 10-hour teaching session. But as I mentioned to you, we're going to include in this the management of Dawa. Why? Because not only should you learn the techniques, but you should become a one man or one woman Dawa organization. You should be able to go anywhere. We literally should be able to drop you anywhere and tell you this is your station. And you should be able to set up a Dawa operation right there. But the tools that you're going to need is called management tools. We're going to talk about those management tools at the end of the techniques, probably sometime tomorrow. We're going to begin by talking about the principles and characteristics of the da'i. That's you and I. The da'i is the person doing the da'wah. The one who is receiving it is the mud'i. The first principle and characteristics of da'wah is that the da'i has to have knowledge. Not just ambition. 
not just emotional drive, and not just a reaction to some insult that somebody has said, and not just a feeling to want to give dawah because you know it's an obligation. All of those things are good, and it's all necessary. But without knowledge, what are you going to do? Without knowledge, you don't know much, and you can't do much. Knowledge is like a candle in the dark. So if you got 20 people in a house, and all the lights are off, and somebody yells, fire, nobody can see where nothing is at. Smoke is filling up the room. Women are screaming, kids are screaming. You only know where the windows is at. All of a sudden, somebody flicks on the light. <laughs> what do you think everybody's eyes go to? They don't care if you're white, you're black, you're poor, you're green, whatever it is, they don't care. All the lights go to that. Is it right or wrong? Because that's the person that can lead everybody out. This is a facsimile of what knowledge is. Knowledge is the light, is the candle for the person who is holding it, and it is also a light and a candle for those who have to follow it. So we have to begin with having basic knowledge. Now, what do we mean by knowledge? We mean knowledge concerning Allah. We mean knowledge concerning the prophets of Allah, and we mean knowledge concerning the basic tenets of Islam. Because our dawah, our dawah is not about Christianity. Our dawah is not about uh, uh, Harun Yahya's uh, scientific breakdown of the atom. Our knowledge is not about philosophy. Our knowledge is not about history. Our, it could include those things, but what is the fundamental knowledge? The fundamental knowledge is ma'rifatullah, ma'rifatul nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ma'rifatul islam bil adillah. Now ma'rifatullah, understanding or knowledge or comprehension concerning Allah, it is contained in the discipline called tawheed. So that means when you want to talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you cannot just talk about Allah any way you want to. You must only talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to what rules? The rules of Tawheed. You cannot talk about the Prophet sallallahu any way you want to. You must only talk about the Prophet sallallahu according to the rules of Risala or Sunnah or Seerah. Ma'aritul Islam bil Adillah. You cannot talk about Islam just in general. Oh, Islam means submission. Yes, it does mean that. But what else does it mean? How do we submit? How do we surrender? What are the sources? Bil adilla, bil hujja, with proof and evidence. What are the proofs and evidence of Islam? What are the proofs and evidence of Islam? Al Quran wa Sunnah. Now, this is when we say they must have correct knowledge. Now, I didn't say you must have deep knowledge. I didn't say that or sophisticated knowledge, I didn't say that, or high knowledge, no, just fundamental knowledge of those three areas, ma'rifat Allah, ma'rifat al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ma'rifat al-Islam bin Adillah. Oh, excuse me. Wait, 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 what do I do here now? Next? Okay. They must understand the Islamic manhaj, that is, the Islamic way, the Islamic methodology, the Islamic, if you want to call it, the cookbook. See, all the knowledge of Islam that we talked about previously, that's like the vegetables and the beef and, uh, and the potatoes, and, uh, but you got to put it all together. You got to heat up the oven. You got to break out the right pans. You got to have the right stuff that you're cooking with. Is right or wrong? That's called the menhaj. You got to know your way around the kitchen. Otherwise, you're going to burn the food up or you're going to blow the kitchen up. There's so many things can happen if you don't know the menhaj. We learn the menhaj from the three generations. Menhaj means how it was done, how it was understood, how it was applied. How? Manhaj. They must understand whom they are speaking to. 
This is important. You have to take the time to listen, to watch, look, understand who is it you're speaking to. Because if you just took a course in comparative religion and you were studying all these verses of the Bible and you was getting yourself ready to talk to these Christians and you as Jehovah Witness keep knocking on your door every day and you say, okay, I'm waiting for him to come back. I got something for him. So he knocks on your door and you say, come right in. And you begin talking to him, so on, so on, so on. He says, what are you talking about? I don't even believe that. Now where do you go? Because you didn't understand that he's not a mainstream Christian. So those Christian dogmas, those evidences and proofs and ideas that you were learning doesn't even apply to him. So now what do you do? You look like a fool. You must understand whom you're talking to. The other thing is, you're going to find out that a greater amount of people are basically atheists. They're born Christians, maybe, or born Hindus, or born Buddhists, or whatever. But essentially, in their life, they are atheists. They don't care one way or the other. As long as they make a dollar and they get along with people, they're cool. What is that? They don't have a sense of religion. That's either atheist or agnostic. Now, what do you do with a person like that? Or you meet a person that says, listen, man, I don't believe in God. I don't go to church. I don't believe in no angels, no prophets, nothing. I don't believe in no religion. I'm, if, if there is a God, I'm God. And I think that anybody that's, that's talking about God, they can't see magic prophets and books and all that crazy stuff is really just crazy. Now prove to me this stuff that you're talking about. Now, see, Sheikh Ahmadida didn't prepare you for that person. Now maybe Harun Yahya did. Maybe. But an atheist or an agnostic person needs a completely different approach. So you got to know whom you're speaking to. They must exhibit wisdom and tolerance. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Invite people to the way of Allah with what? No, the first part of the ayah. Ud'u ila sabili rabbik bil hikmah wal maw'idatun hasana. Yes. The jadil comes after. You must exhibit wisdom and tolerance. Wisdom means always be dealing from here not from emotion not from reaction don't let people push your buttons and let them take over and then you become the reactionary they jabbing and you backing up and you ducking no don't let the people do that to you always you take the center of the court you be in command of yourself long as you command in yourself you don't have to worry about what the person is talking about you just evaluating and never getting angry, and never becoming emotional, and never dealing from personality. Always dealing from a point of principle. Principle. Now that's not always easy because somebody might call you, might slander the prophets. So a My brother asked me, what do we do? If somebody cursed the prophet, should I knock him out? <laughs> you can't knock out everybody. You're going to meet somebody that can knock you out. And it, and it doesn't matter. You get knocked out or he get knocked out. What happens? What have you ac accomplished? You gave the wrong dower. Whether you get knocked out or the other person get knocked out, you gave the wrong dower. So you must exhibit wisdom. The Prophet Sallallahu said, the believer is what? Firasa. Is, is this the word? Firas? Anybody here is Arab? What's the word? Firas. Huh? Firas. Does it mean he have uh, his... Uh, huh? Yes. Firasa. Yes, it means he see before it happens. The believer is like that. He looks deep into things. 
He can see in front of him. He looks into things. He's intuitive, I think is the word. That's part of wisdom. And tolerance means somebody can curse you out. They can curse you out about the religion, about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, about your family, whatever, and you don't even change your composure. You don't change your composure because you got tolerance. And you may have to talk to somebody that's gay and they're looking at you like you sweet. <laughs> but you got to talk to them. They ask you, brother, can you tell me about Islam? <laughs> that's a human being, right? You got, it is a human being. It's an animal. It's more animal than it is uh, the high part, but it's still a human being. They also deserve dawah. Now, later on, I'm going to show you what position to take because there's a couple of things we do. There's something here that you're going to see that's interesting called the wheel of disposition. That tells you what position to take with the different people. But still, that's a human being. And if they ask you, you got to tell them. That's tolerance. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told the companions that man that walked in the Prophet's Masjid and went over and urinated in the Masjid in front of everybody. The companions wanted to beat him up. What the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said do? Go get some water and pour the water on there and let the man sit down. This tolerance. They must have strong arguments for Tawheed. Because our first argument is not about the Prophet Our first argument is not about Islam. Our first discussion with them is about a Tawheed. You should have always in your pocket or in your chest or in your arsenal 10, 15, 20 nice arguments on Tawheed. Hit him with this one, hit him low, hit him high, hit him from the left, hit him from the right. When he says this, he says that, give him another one, give him another ayat, give him ayat to Kursi. That'll handle about, that'll handle about five different uh, issues right there. Hit him with, hit him with Kul Allah wa Had. That's a powerful one right there. Hit him with Hu Allahu la ilaha illa hu alimul ghaibi. Hit him with that one. Hit him with Hit him with that one. Hit him with, there's so many different ayats of Tawheed that you can hit him with. Have strong arguments for Tawheed because what are we calling them to first? What did the Prophet Sallallahu tell Mu'adh ibn Jabal when he was going to the people? Oh Mu'adh, you're going to some people who do not know about Allah. So the first thing you do is do what? Teach them about Allah. Spend time talking to people only about Allah. Forget about, don't go into all this about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and about Islam and you, you ain't supposed to drink and this is haram and then you got people leading you. They taking you to the third floor. Uh, listen, what about the four, four wives? Uh, uh, what about uh, uh, you guys can't eat shrimp? Uh, what about can, uh, you can't gamble? Uh, what about them sisters wearing them things over their faces and stuff like what you have to do is you got to receive that and tell them say listen that's a good that's a nice issue but listen there's something more fundamental than that let's hold up on that to me let's let's go down to the let's start in the let's start on the bottom where the tree grows grow from the root do, do the tree grow from the root or, or start off with the branches they say no it starts with the root but well, that's where we want to start yes You're in control. You're in control. You're not a jukebox. That's what I tell people. I am not a jukebox. Do you see a place where you put coins at? The jukebox, you put the coin in, you press the buttons, and the tune you want comes out. Is that wrong? Well, I'm not a jukebox. If you want an answer and you want to know about Islam, there is a procedure. If you went to school, you might have some collegiate questions, but if you didn't graduate from grade school, guess what? You got to go back to school. So let's go. Okay, 
You must have strong arguments for Tawheed. You must be aware of the major religions. Now, major religions means Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, Confucianism, Zoroastrianism, Judaism. Those are the major religions. You must know about those major religions. Now, there's branches that spun off of those religions. Jainism and uh, what's, the, what's those guys from India the, where the, the big turbans and the stuff come down? Sikhism. See, there's a whole lot of branches that came off of the major ones, but if you are basically aware, and I don't mean that you got to write a thesis on these different religions, because you don't. Soup is soup. Steak is steak. And salad is salad. All you got to do is know, be aware of the major religions so that when, a, when a, you talk to a person and they say, uh, well, I'm a Sikh. I always say, what you seeking? <laughs> no, they say, no, Sikh. What is Sikh? I already know what it is he's talking about, but I'm just using a little humor, you know. I want to let him, think, let, let him think that I don't know. So the thing is, you must be aware of the major religions. It's like a man told me in London. I told him, I said, you know anything about Muslims? Muesli? He said, that's what I eat for breakfast. <laughs> muesli? I didn't know. I thought, he was, I, thought he was, I thought he was joking. I didn't know what muesli was. It's a cereal, right? Yeah, he said, I eat muesli for breakfast. <laughs> they should be aware of the major concepts. Now, you got religions and you got concepts. Now, what are concepts? Concepts are ologies and isms. Ologies and isms. Now, when you deal with Christianity, let me tell you something right away. The first thing you need to know is that almost 95% of all Christians are really Christologists. They don't know it. Because only maybe 5% of them have really studied the life and the message and the person of Jesus Christ. And after studying the life, the message, and the mission of Jesus Christ, alayhi salam, only a few of them decided to adopt the actual life, message, and mission of Jesus Christ. So the rest of them are what? They're Christologists. They're following what have been created, that, that metaphor, that metaphor, that mythology that have been created around the name of Jesus Christ, and that's what they're doing. But you don't, don't call them Christologists right away because they'll be insulted. But that's what they are. You have to be aware of the major concepts and all of the major isms, including the I am, the I-ism, the me-ism. See, most people are just me-ism, they-ism. So their religion is her lamb, his lamb, we lamb, they lamb. Just like we follow in Islam, they follow in they lamb. Her lamb, his lamb. So it's allergies and isms, and there are names to most of them that we're going to go through. They should be clean in their appearance. Now, this is very important, brothers and sisters. The way you look. The way you look. Now, I'm not saying you got to dress in a, and you, I'm not saying you got to dress like the brothers with Farrakhan with a bow tie and all that. I'm not saying you got to do that. But I'm saying that you have to determine for yourself. Every Muslim should determine generally how they dress. Now, I'm not saying that you have to have a special dower uniform or you got to have a special type of dress, but generally the Muslims should determine for themselves, do I want to dress like Kafirs or do I want to generally dress like a Muslim? You got to ask that for yourself. Now, if you don't really want to be known as a Muslim, then all you got to do is get all the designer stuff and put all it on and nobody will ever know that you're a Muslim, especially if you don't act like it. But if you really want to give dawah, you should, there should be something about you that when somebody looks at you, you distinguish yourself as a Muslim. 
Your clothes should be clean. If you're wearing jeans, there's no harm in putting a little spray starch and running iron over them. No harm in that, brothers. You don't have to look like you just jumped out of a washing machine, a dryer. Just because you're a student, you know, you throw the stuff in the dryer and just throw it on and run out. And, well, that's all right, but not for Dawa. Because most people in the working world, they do not walk out into the street with clothes that just, they just pull off the dryer and put it on. Is that right or wrong? Now, I don't say you have to, but I'm only saying to you that in many cases, people are going to judge what you've got to say by what? The way you look. For instance, if you went to a dentist and you was out in the waiting room and you start hearing all this hammering and drilling and people screaming. You think you would, how long would you sit there to wait for that dentist to come out to, to give you a root and canal? If you went to a doctor and people's out in the waiting room, the, the waiting room is dirty. And then the doctor, he comes out, he comes and says, okay, you're next, Mr. So-and-so. And he's got an apron on with blood, and he got a machete in his hand. <laughs> well, of course, you say that, well, Shaq, I mean, you're giving too much. That's a, that's a graphic, ridiculous example. Well, there are some Muslims who are giving dawah, and you step back and look at the scene, it's the same thing. A student invites another student in their room to give them dawah. And they haven't emptied the trash in two weeks. They haven't made up their bed since they started school. They got clothes under the bed, over the bed, around over there. They got bottles, cans, and chips, and, and takeaway trays all over the room. And when they come inside, they say, oh, excuse me for a minute, I'm going to get this here book for you. Now, what example do you think that sets? The wrong example. The da'i should organize themselves and spend some time. Organize your room at home. Organize your clothes. Organize the area where you want to give dawah. Think to yourself on the campus. If you're on the campus, think of a room in the campus that's your room. It, ain't got, it don't have to be your room. It's just a special room on the campus that's open for everybody. But when you want to talk to somebody about some dawah, say, listen, um, yeah, you got 20 minutes? Yeah, I got, I got a little room over here that I usually sit in. It's nice, it's quiet, and it's already set up. You might put a little posters in there, a little set up. So when they sit down, it's like a doctor's office, isn't it? You see the difference? It's on your terms now. They should have honorable source of their livelihood. Brother or sister, if you are engaged or your family is engaged in haram business, please don't take nobody to your business and give dawah to them, and please don't let nobody know. Because if you're engaged in dishonorable, haram, livelihood, or if you're engaged in fahsha or munkar, immoral things in the day or the night, then your giving dawah is sort of hypocritical, isn't it? A non-Muslim will pick that up. Maybe not today, but tomorrow or the next day, and they're going to say to somebody else, can you believe it? This guy gave me some pamphlets to read about Islam and said that they don't drink, they don't this, they don't that. I mean, his father got a store around there. Do you think that person is going to, what do you think that person is going to think about Islam and Muslims in general? That they're two-faced. So we should be, the way we live, how we earn our living should be consistent, reasonably consistent with the dawah that we're offering. They must have a willingness to cooperate and a willingness to support others in the work. This is called ta'awan wa ta'wasaw. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa ta'awanu ala al-birri wa taqwa. Wa la ta'awanu ala al-ithm Wal Udwan. He says also, Watawasaw Bil Sabri, Watawasaw Bil Marhama, Watawasaw Bil Hakki, Watawasaw Bil Sabr. 
Tawasaw and ta'awan is the nature of this work. You can't do this dawah by yourself. And I'm also want to tell you, brothers and sisters, also, sisters, when you give dawah, if you go to some place where other women are at, their homes or whatever, always take another sister with you. If you invite someone to your home, a woman, try to have another sister with you, your mother, your blood sister, or another sister. Why? Because one out of every five women in the Western world is a straight out lesbian. Two out of every five women in the Western world have experimented with lesbianism. And three out of five, they don't mind. They don't care. Now, sisters, I'm telling you this. Take it from your brother. Take it from experience. You always got to be careful. And some women come into Islam because it's like the fox being inside the chicken house. Now just think about what I just said. Now Allah mentioned in the Quran that if you find some women guilty of indecency, didn't he say that in the Quran? If you find women guilty of indecency, he didn't say fornication, he didn't say adultery, he said indecency. What is meant there? Because it was understood in the time of the Prophet that there were some practices like that. And if you find some men engaged in indecency, so indecency is not fornication and adultery here. This is an indecent immorality that is other than fornication and adultery. So be careful in your giving dower that where you go and who you bring, try always to make support with other people because what you don't see, another person will see and you can always protect yourself by the witnessing of another person. Also, there are resources that you need that you cannot obtain by yourself. Eleven, they should show reliance upon Allah. You must have tawakkal, tawakkal, and courage. Show reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't worry about nobody, how intelligent that they are, how clever they are, how eloquent that they are, how arrogant they are. Be willing to listen what they have to say and also be willing to say to yourself or to say to them, uh, listen, after, um, after listening to what you have to say, what I'd really like to do is, um, I'd like to give thought to what you had to say. You, you made some good points. I want to give thought to it and Let's meet tomorrow, inshallah. Because what happened? You're not really prepared for what they had to say. Or be prepared to tell somebody. I can't answer that question for you, but I know somebody who can. But always show your composure and your willingness to talk to anybody. Because why? You put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the very beginning. The Messenger of Allah said, Allah said, he didn't have all the answers. But he put his trust upon Allah. Allah says to him, فَتَوَكَّلُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Be ready to face a challenge. This is called sabr عَلَى الْأَذَى fi. If you say you want to give dawah, don't think that all dawah is going to be licking lollipops. Don't think it's all going to be sweet. Don't think it's going to be you sitting down doing some like intellectual debating. You may find yourself in a situation um, where you are facing a physical challenge, an intellectual challenge, a spiritual challenge. Identify your challenge and your obstacles. Now what does this mean? Don't overestimate and don't underestimate. Never. Don't underestimate who you're going to talk to. Don't puff your chest up. 
Don't fill your kima up with air. Don't think, young Simeon, that you know what you're doing. You read these books, you took that course from the Sheikh, you read these books and pamphlets, you did this course, you got four or five Dawa certificates, and you know, you know what you're getting ready to go do. Let's go blast these Christians out. Don't underestimate. At the same token, don't overestimate. Don't listen to this radio personality or this professor or whoever it is and they seem like they're so powerful and they're so crisp and clear and eloquent and they just coming downhill on everybody and you don't know what to say. So, I don't know what to do. Uh, shake, shake, please come talk to Keep your composure because every, there's a shoe to fit everybody. There's a time and there's a place and there's a proof and there's an evidence. Learn to disarm your opponent. How many people here is in mar knows martial arts? If a person has a weapon in their hand, sometimes it might be better to be able to run faster than they can. See, you don't want to try to be no Bruce Lee or Jet Lee. You know, because you saw those moves because it may not happen that way. You should be in good condition so that if you cannot disarm this person, at least you can stay out of harm. So learn to stay out of harm or to disarm. Now, disarming a person is, a, is itself a technique. We're going to learn some of those techniques later on. But disarming means take the air out of their attack. You see, it's like in boxing, if I see that a man is not in good shape, the first thing for me to do is dance around for a minute, drop down, hit him straight in the solar plexus, blast him good, knock all the air out, because that's where the power is at right there. And usually if you hit him good in the solar plexus, that's it, the fight is over. There's another place you want you can kick them to. The sisters know about that. And usually the fight is over. Or give them an ayat, give them a Quran, give them something that's almost like mustard gas or pepper spray. Back them up. Learn different things that you can use for arrogant people who are clever people, how you can disarm them. Allah says, Use direct and convincing arguments. This is what Allah said. Speak direct. Be honest. Look straight at them. And you don't have to be clever. Just be straightforward. Be honest. Be simple. Use common sense. Reinforce the generally agreed upon principles. What does that mean? That means when you talk to somebody, there's no sense arguing with them about something both of you agree with. Did you ever begin talking to somebody and you find out that there's not really that much to argue about? Because you're talking to them and they're shaking their heads saying, yeah, I agree with that. But you, you know they're a Christian. And so you, you keep on saying different things because they can't just be believing in everything you're saying. They got to disagree with something you want to argue. No, if there's no argument, don't try to find one. And if you relate a proposition to them or explain something that they didn't understand or something that they misunderstood, don't keep hammering away at the same thing. Whatever's agreed upon, let them know. That's good. At least we agreed upon that. Let's go to the next point. So in the course of the conversation, you might have had five points and you agreed upon two or three. Is that good enough? That's good enough for one day. Tell them, say, listen, we agreed upon two or three good points. I think we had a good conversation. I think we accomplished quite a bit. And we didn't agree upon everything, but we're going to disagree for the day on those points honorably. Okay? See you tomorrow. You leave that person in a dignified way. Distinguish the Islamic principles. What does that mean? 
while you and another person are talking, they're giving you their principles. What you want to do is always in your conversation, you may not use Islamic terms, but you want to do what? You want to distinguish the Islamic principles. Later on, we're going to talk about how to do that, how to talk to an atheist without using any religious terminology at all. You can get an atheist to agree about the outer canon Islam and the outer canon Iman without using any religious terminologies at all, not even the word God. You probably say, well, how do you do that? We're going to see a little bit later on. Obtain consensus upon those principles. That means when you use the Islamic principles, when you're talking to somebody about Islamic principles, what do you want to do? Starting with kalima, la ilaha illallah, and Muhammad Rasulullah, and then going down, beginning with the outer canal Islam, amantu billah, wa malaikatuhu, beginning with those principles, we want to do what? Go one by one and use different ways to get them to do what? Agree. Now you already agree. So if you get them to agree, what do we have? A consensus. Make your case and complete the invitation. You see? Make your case and complete the invitation. How many people here have done sales? What's the bottom line of sales? Meeting, meeting of needs and minds. And at the, at the end of, the, how do you, what's the bottom line? I mean, if I'm your sales manager, I don't want to hear about how many people you went to meet. I don't want to hear about how good you talk. I don't want to hear about your presentations. What's the bottom line if I'm the sales manager? Selling. Selling. I want to know. How many, how many deals did you sign and close? Is that right? So don't forget in giving a dower to make your case and complete the invitation. Now, you don't necessarily complete the invitation today. Some customers, you have to learn to work on them for about a month. Is that right, brother? Years sometimes. The years, especially if you're selling houses. Illustrate the signs of Allah through science. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In the fi khalqi samawati wal ardi wa akhtilaf in layli wa nahar, la ayatul ulul al bab. Did he say that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Wa shamsi wa duhaha wal qamri idha tolaha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, throughout the Quran, Allah is saying to us, He is swearing, wal asr, huh? Wal layli idha yabsha. What is He doing here? He's giving us propositions scientific propositions, environmental propositions, by virtue to do what? To emphasize in our minds that he is al Khaliq. You see? We have to do the same thing. If you want to talk to an atheist, an agnostic, a person that says they don't believe in God, somebody that says they are Scientologists or something of that nature, the way you want to talk to them is do not use the word God. Use another attribute. Allah is al-Khaliq, isn't he? Huh? He's the source of all creation, isn't he? So you use a different attribute for them. You don't say Allah. You say the source of all creation. The source of all power. The source of existence. I mean, we're all existing. There had to be a source. If they agreed to that, good. You can start right there. So illustrate the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through science. Now we're not scientists. And we're not trying to prove anything through science. Not absolutely. We're only making references to science. And that's why the other night when I was giving a lecture and somebody said that uh, we can prove to people that Allah, if somebody said that who created Allah, that there's a way to prove that. No, there is no way to prove that. There is no way to prove that. However, there are some approaches that we can use to answer that question. But I say to you, be careful. That's a tricky question. That's a dangerous endeavor. That's like a minefield. 
and you can step on the mind and blow it up right in your face. If you're talking with somebody who's really tricky and clever, he can have you saying something about a loss of hundred dollars that you have no right to say. Because our job is not to prove any absolutes. Somebody said, prove to me that God exists. And so you start talking for about an hour. <coughs> Shaitan got you. Because our job is not to prove that the law exists, is it? That's not our job to prove that the law exists. Our job is to make references to the human beings. Allah says, yatafakkaroon. Doesn't he? For those who reflect. Show the consistency of the previous scriptures, the prophets, and the messages. Now, what does this mean? The Quran has basically three messages. What are they? Who knows the three themes of the Quran? It doesn't matter what page you turn to. Doesn't matter what story. Doesn't matter what page, what example. The Quran basically has three themes. Huh? No. Yeah, well, Jannah is, is Jannah's part of one of the themes. Yes. Tawheed is the first one. Righteousness. No. That's, that's, that righteousness leads to one of them. Yes. No, that, that, that is to lead to another one. Yes. That's Akhirah is one. See, Tawheed, Akhirah, and Qasas al Anbiya. These are the three themes. The three themes of the Quran Tawheed, Qasas al Anbiya, and Akhirah. All the things, all the laws that's in the Quran are for what? To help us to do what? To get towards the Akhirah. Allah speaks about Amr bin Ma'roof and Nahir al Munkar to do what? To help pave the way towards Al Akhirah. The laws, the haram and the halal, to do what? To pave the way towards Al Akhirah. The Qasas al Anbiya is to do what? To tell us the challenges in life that you're going to meet, that the Prophet وسلم, they dealt with. That's what the Qasas al Anbiya is about. Teach you the different kind of human beings, the challenges that you're going to meet. And the other things Allah is talking about, What is that for? That's to reinforce Tawheed. All these, are, and as a matter of fact, if you read Amma the, 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 the last Jews of the Quran and the 29th Jews of the Quran, those two Jews, Last two juz is basically to do what? To reinforce Tawheed. And those were the surahs that were first revealed in Mecca. Most of the surahs in Tabarak and in uh, and, uh, juz, and juz Amma are what? Surah al Makkiyah. Is that correct? Why? Because they reinforce Tawheed. Those are the surahs we want to use and talking to people about Islam initially. First, point out the principles of human behavior, human civilization, and historical evidence. Now, we're coming from Tawheed, Qasas al-Anbiya, al-Akhirah. Now we're coming into what we call micro examples. That's examples of what? About the human being themselves. Human nature, human psychology, Human behavior, human civilization, historical evidence. All of these are things that we can use along with Tawheed, Qasas al Anbiya, and Al Akhirah. Okay, brothers and sisters, uh, we're in an atmosphere here where it's a little bit dark. I mean, I don't have no popcorn for you. Now, if you get a little sleepy, then what you need to do is just raise your hand. Go to the water, take your nice quick little wudu, and come back and get your seat. Otherwise, what's going to happen is you're going to miss 20 minutes of this movie. Now, you, you're going to get the disc and all that, but you're, not, you're going to have the meat and the potatoes. See, this is the meat and the potatoes. That's the meat and the potatoes right there. I'm going to give you a disc with the same thing on it, but what I'm giving you is the gravy. And you can't swallow the meat and potatoes without the gravy. So if you get tired, raise your hand and go make a wudu. Bismillah. 
show the fallacy of certain concepts and beliefs and conversely show the Islamic and there's something missing here I'll have to add it in there show the Islamic proposition that's what that word should say show the fallacy of certain concepts and beliefs and conversely show the Islamic proposition so when pe certain people you're talking to certain people and they give you their concept they give you their belief they give you their concept and their belief or you already targeted it you understood it already what you have to do is you got to show the fallacy of that belief show the weakness of it show the foolishness of it show the futility of it and then after that show the other side don't tell somebody something is wrong and you can't tell them what's right. Don't tell somebody something is not good, something is wrong, you can't show them what's right. You can't tell somebody to stop doing something without giving them what? An alternative. Don't talk about a problem they have, but you can't offer them the solution. This is what we want to learn to do. Provide the Islamic answer and the alternative to those fallacies. Now, the Islamic answer or the Islamic alternative, we can use another word, the Islamic proposition. Brothers and sisters, this word proposition that I'm giving you is a key word. Don't forget it. Another way of saying to a person, think of, I, I want to give you a proposition. In your conversation, I always say to a person, um, think about this. Yeah, reflect on that. Consider this. See, consider this. Think about this. Let me give you this proposition. Suppose we, suppose we think about this for a moment. How about this? So now you're not talking in a, in a tone of what? Absolute. You're not talking about either or. People don't like that. Oh, so that means everything you say is right and everything I say is wrong. So that means if I don't believe like what you believe, that means I'm wrong. Is that what people will tell you, right? So I mean, Muslim, everything Muslims say is right and everybody else is wrong, everybody else in the world is wrong. No, no. Trump said, no, all I'm trying to do is offer you our, the perspective of the Quran. It is the Islamic perspective, but it's only a proposition for you to consider. It's not that everybody's wrong or everybody's right. There's a whole lot of in between. But this is a proposition that you should maybe consider. For us, it's an Islamic answer. For us, it's an Islamic alternative. In some cases, for us, it's a hukum, a determination, a law. For us, it's a fact. But you can't put it to the other people that way. Learn to use what I call. OK, uh, have we completed an hour here already? Have we? Five more minutes? OK, we're going to go five more minutes then. Strategies and the techniques of dawah. No, as a matter of fact, what we'll do here is we will not uh, go further. What I'll do is I'm gonna, I'll stop here for a moment um, before we go into preparation, uh, strategies, techniques of dawah. I'll stop here and I'll take a few questions, just two or three questions. Because everything I said is, is sort of like, um, I mean, it's, it's plain. It's like the leaves on the tree. Uh, I could have said it a little differently, and in the course of our uh, uh, um, conversation or hearing it again, you, you will or I will. Uh, but if there was something you didn't understand, then you can ask me. But if it's just a, another way of saying something or something you want to add, hold up to that. Right now, the hot dog don't need no mustard. Yes, Akhi. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. How do you answer uh, a typical argument that people have? Uh, when they say that basically truth doesn't exist and truth is always relative and there's no absolute truth, how would you answer to Okay, I've got a book back there, I've got a book back there on the table back there called Arguments with Atheists. Arguments about the doubters of the Quran. Um, arguments, rational arguments by Sheikh Ali Tamimi. I've got a couple nice books back there that give you some of those techniques right there. For me, I've got several techniques you know, I, I, I like to talk with atheists who, who want to come with these kind of... I would ask them, I reverse it. You say, wh what's the question again? Well, whether tr truth is absolute, whether truth exists or not. Okay, so, so if truth exists or it doesn't exist, what is truth? No, wait, wait, wait. That's my, that's my question, back to them. If it exists or it doesn't exist, What's the basis of the question? The que for, it, for a question to come, it must exist. 
Otherwise, nothing to question about. Yeah, the, the question is more whether it's, uh, each and every one of us can have his own truth. Oh, that's different. Truth is an absolute fact that is undeniable for the person who holds it. That's a different argument. Now, that's easy. I tell a person, I'll tell you what truth is. Fear is truth. They say, what do you mean by that? Go to the top of a building and look down. Every human being, and even an animal, when they go to a height and look down, they back up. That's truth. It's instinctive, but it's truth. So there's a lot of different ways to approach somebody who's trying to be clever. But if it's a person who's really trying to understand, there's a way to bring it all back. Then there's a way even that we can use the Quran to substantiate a scientific way of talking to a person. We'll learn some of those techniques too. Now, some of what, uh, some of what um, you want to know, I'm not going to say it all here because I can't. I got about uh, 30 books on that table over there. This course really has about 65 different books that I would recommend people to read. Books that I use for myself to understand different people's approaches. I don't say you got to read all those books or read the ones that I read, but I can tell you this. If you don't read, you're not going to expand your knowledge. But if you do read, a lot of the questions that you may have today are going to be answered because other people, other Muslims, have been already been approached in these ways. There's nothing new under the sun. There is nothing new. There's nothing new on the earth at all. Anything the earth produces, it's been producing. Ain't no new answers and ain't no new questions. All people is doing is shaking and baking, you know, and putting some new spice on it, making it seem like it's new. McDonald's been here all the time. It's always been trash and dog food. All they're doing is taking dog food, worse than dog food. They're using marketing, advertisement, recycling, and, and other kind of techniques, and letting people know that just to belong to the McDonald's family itself is to belong to something. People go to McDonald's just to belong to something. That's another conversation, but I'm talking about the, the McDonald's age. I'm gonna to talk to you about the McDonald's age. It's selling people an idea. So once you sell the idea, they take everything to go with it. Who you think sell the most toys in the world? Who do you think is the top toy seller in the world? Who do you think? No, it's not. It's McDonald's. Who do you think is selling most cookies in the world? McDonald's. People think of McDonald's as a burger and a fry and a shake. McDonald's is the top seller of 37 products in the world. Because once you join the McDonald family and you got that McDonald mentality, you're going to buy everything McDonald say. And they should put a Mac clinic next to every McDonald hospital. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> somebody. What, what, somebody over here had a question. Yes, Akhi. Um, the Islamic Institute that you have in America, yes. what do you basically do? Is it training people to do that? The Islamic Teaching Institute basically does two things. Uh, we take new Muslims and emerging Muslims. Now most of you here are emerging Muslims. Emerging Muslims are people who are emerging into Islamic consciousness and Islamic work. Out of that static Islam, that, that static Muslim mentality, you know that static Muslim mentality. They're emerging into Islamic consciousness and Islamic revival and Islamic dawah, the emerging Muslims. Now the new Muslims are people like myself whose mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers and all that there didn't know nothing about Islam and we accepted Islam or embraced Islam or reverted to Islam or whatever you want to call it, whether it was yesterday or 35 years ago. Now the new Muslims and the emerging Muslims almost have the same needs. First of all, they need to know Islam. Is that correct? So the Islamic Teaching Institute has designed an Islamic teaching course especially for new and emerging Muslims. And I teach it just like I'm teaching this Dawa course. I got a set of books and a syllabus and a set of tools that I'm using to teach it. And so in 30 hours, I can take a new Muslim, brand new Muslim, and after 30 hours, 
they got basically the tools that they need. Now, they're not going to learn it in 30 hours, but they got the tools. Now, don't you think that it's important for a new Muslim to get the tools? Then it is also important for an emerging Muslim to step back, like Musa Islam did. You know when, he, when Musa was looking, and he got to, and, and he got to the, 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 the place where the two rivers parted, him and his companion, and the fish jumped in the water? What was that a sign for Musa? To go back, right? He knew he had to meet Khidr. He had to go back and meet him. So you and I, we're looking for ourselves. We're looking for the right way. Sometimes you got to go back. I say all of you, some of you brothers and sisters that are sitting here have basically covered most of the basics. That's good. But you should go back and review it. Those of you who have not, go back and complete it. It won't hurt you. The Islamic Teaching Institute teaches an Islamic course, Islamic teaching course for new and emerging Muslims. That's what it does. Second thing, it teaches dawah training for Muslims, individuals, and organizations. This dawah course that I'm doing now is for individuals in this case, but I do this also for organizations. So an organization calls me because they don't have a dawah package. They don't have nobody that does dawah. So what I do is I go to an organization and I take five of their people and I give them a dawah training course, including management, so that when I leave, they got the tools, they got the kit, they got the training, they got the management, and then they can plug back and forth with myself or, some, or I send somebody to do what? As a consultant. So that's what we do for the most part. Uh, in addition to that, we are now uh, uh, going into the field of media. We've just been licensed for a satellite television station. And the reason we got involved in it, not because we had money or that we could, we saw ourselves being able to do that, but I saw that um, I couldn't duplicate myself. It's impossible for me to be, well, almost impossible. Almost. <laughs> it's impossible for me to be in five or six places at one time. And I would like to be. I'd like to be right here and in Sheffield and America and in France and also in Saudi Arabia teaching the same course. And I got people that's calling right now. But I can't be. So what do I want to do? I want to duplicate myself. And I also want to duplicate the materials. So by duplicating myself and duplicating the materials, what do we do? You can spread it. That's the phenomenon of this dean. So to do this, we thought that this is, a, this is a field of media. Duplication, reproduction, broadcasting. So by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we went ahead to get this license. Another thing that we wanted to do, we wanted to find somebody that had a studio in different places so that we could replicate materials, reproduce materials, produce materials, mashallah. Alhamdulillah, the law sent us down here and the brother is in that in, in engagement. So these are the things that we do. And then in addition to that, we do ta'awin with organizations in this particular field to improve ourselves and do better. Uh, the issue of managing uh, or offering Islamic services is just something that every organization does. The Global Islamic Youth Center is not set up here for five prayers a day. That wasn't what it was set up for, right? That's something that Muslims got to do anyway. It wasn't set up here to do Juma. But if you've got 500 people coming through here, it don't make sense for them to send somewhere, go somewhere else, does it? So Juma and Salah and a library and other things that we do, it just goes along with the package. But basically, we're engaged in Islamic teaching and preaching and dawah training and, uh, and the field of media, inshallah. The other thing is, whatever we are not able to get to a person through the satellite, DVD, VCD, CD audio, cassette, VHS, or internet. That's all media. And we're going to do it all, straight across the board. And we're going to concentrate on dawah and education. This is what we want to do. We want to concentrate on dawah and education. If Allah lets us, if Allah let this brother open up the studio he's talking about doing, and Allah lets us have this here television station, and then we do some other things that we're talking about doing, this thing is going to go, inshallah. We're going to have an alternative. We're going to do something. 
The next thing is we want to train brothers and sisters to give this da'wah because if they do, inshallah, can you think if there were 20 people that understood, that 20 people that completed the third level of this program or the third level of who's anybody's program in Australia, 20 in the UK, 20 in America, 20 in a, another part of Europe, 20 in Asia, just 20. We didn't say 100 people, just 20. And those 20 people themselves, they taught 100 people a year. How many people is that? 2,000. They taught 100 people a year. How many people is in this room here? See? In the course of a year, generally speaking, like last year, last year I did about 2,800 and some odd students that completed at least the first level. I did about 480 something students that completed the second level. And I've only had 17 students that was able to complete the third level. Because the third level is not a joke. It takes a little bit more time because it's a research level. But the whole thing is getting them to complete that first level because the first level now they can go out and at least they got the tools to do this dawah. This is the whole, this is the, this is the issue. And I want to also, I want to depersonalize it. It, it. This is not really, this is not the Khalid Yassin package. It's not what it is. And uh, really, I, I'm thinking seriously, just take the name off of it. This is not the Khalid Yassin package. Inshallah, I'm just initiating it. That's all I'm doing. After a while, it won't even matter who initiated it. It's just like, it's like the television. If you ask somebody, well, who, who set up the television? Who's the first person to set up television? Does anybody here know? The average person doesn't know, and, and it doesn't even matter. The fact is that it's a powerful instrument that people are using all over the world. We want this to be an instrument. And if it already existed, I would not be doing it. I would simply take what was already existed and use it. Has anybody here ever seen a dawah manual? A manual of dawah that is audio, visual? To give you the step-by-step -step methodology, the fic, the background, and also the techniques. Anybody see one? In any bookstores anywhere? No. The other thing is that we want to take it from this level to a much higher level where it becomes professional, that anybody in the world will not mind to take it. This is not really a good PowerPoint presentation. I mean, this is a PowerPoint presentation that, you know, I did it. And I really don't know that much about PowerPoint, to be honest with you. I mean, the brother who set me up here can tell you that. But I was giving this course for like two years without a PowerPoint presentation. Can you imagine that? And I ran into a young brother, about 15 years old, in Jubail. And he said to me, Sheikh, did you ever hear of PowerPoint? I said, yeah, I heard of it. I think I got that on my computer. He said, Sheikh, you should, do, you should put your presentation in a PowerPoint. It will be much easier for you, and other people could see it better. So I said, well, um, I gave him my notes. And I said, well, let me see what it looks like. And that young brother did a PowerPoint presentation for me in two days. I was shocked. I said, now look how foolish I, f I feel. Two years, maybe three years I was doing this here, PowerPoint presentation on a, on a, on a what do you call that board with the colors? Whiteboard. On a whiteboard. Not a white boy, but a, a, a white board. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was doing it on a, on a whiteboard. And I mean, a board like that one over there. You know, I used to divide the board and be dancing around in different colors and everything and, you know, look good. But alhamdulillah, I could sit in this chair here. That young brother got some blessings, subhanAllah. Now, we want to take it from here and make it into interactive. Interactive. Well, all the notes that we're talking about, when I say the Bible, boom, the Bible opens up. 
And I got the software right there, King James Version, different songs and so. If I said, he said Zoroastrianism, boom, what their book is, boom, hit it, opens right up on you. That's what we really want to do. And we're going to do that with my brother here, inshallah. But we got to start somewhere, brothers and sisters, and this is where we are right now. So I just want to let you know this, this is really raw. It's not that sophisticated. It's just that the information, is a lot of information that goes into it, and I love to do it. This is what I love to do. Okay, so I think we can take a break here, brother, and we can perform our salah. And then right after the salah, brothers and sisters, we will come back, inshallah, to where we left off at. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika wa nashadu wa la ilaha ila'ant wa nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayhi.